Hello and welcome to season two of the Clio Edge podcast. I'm JC Polanco, and I'm the president and CEO of the Council on Legal Education Opportunity. You know, we're so excited to bring you another season of some amazing guests to talk about law school, law school admissions, the practice of law, and inclusion. I mean, it's so it's such an important uh, topic in today's times. You know, we have our, our first guest of season two with us today, Professor Rick Perry of the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, who also serves as the Diversity Director of Equity and Inclusion at the law school. Welcome, Professor Petrie. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you for inviting me to the show. Now, you know, what's interesting is that um, you have an interesting last name. I love that name, Petri. And unfortunately, <laughs> uh, spell check uh, sometimes thinks it's Perry. Do you get that often? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Over, over the years, man, I've had oh, my name, last name pronounced all kinds of ways. I don't get hung up on that. It's all good. Pro- Professor, thank you so much for joining us today. And congratulations on receiving the Education Award from the Clio Board of Trustees for their uh, for your amazing work in the field of education. Yeah, thank you. I'm I'm totally humbled and honored to to be a recipient of this award. I I didn't see it coming. I didn't even know that I had been nominated. Uh, but I'm I'm completely just humbled to to be a recipient. You know, our board of directors, our advisory council, and our and our staff, they're so excited um, about not only the nomination, but presenting you with that award for all of the work that you've done uh, to really break uh, and shatter glass ceilings at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. So just know that you have uh, a lot of support, not only from all of the students that are around the country that you've worked with, but here at, the, at Clio, the, the enthusiasm about the good work that you're doing at Mitchell Hamlin cannot be contained. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's it's such an important time for this type of work. There are forces at play that would love to keep uh, folks that look like you and me out of law school, out of the practice of law, out of a number of professions. And I remember when the Supreme Court decision first came out that basically eliminated uh, affirmative action and it said in terms of admissions, you can't take race into account. I was I was very angry for a couple of days. And then I thought, well, Rick, you can sit here and you can be angry or you can figure out some things that you can do. And so I've just stayed committed, double down, maybe even triple down on my commitment to make sure that I do everything in my power to make sure that our students continue to get access to legal education. And do we thank you for that? Uh, I mean, it's so important. And as far as, you know, I want to get into the mind of, uh, Oh, Professor Petrie, I, I do. I want to know more about what drove you to be an attorney. What what called your attention to become an attorney and practice for so long before turning to, to education? Yeah, well, I, I grew up in a relatively s- small city, Spokane, Washington. And when I was growing up, there was one black attorney, a, a gentleman named Carl Maxey in Spokane. There were no black doctors no black judges, no black police officers, and very, very few black-owned businesses. We had a barbershop and maybe a little restaurant, a couple taverns, things like that. But I had a dream as a kid, it may sound corny, but it was true, you know, that I would someday be a lawyer. But that was a big dream for a, a little black boy from Spokane, Washington. And part of me, to be honest, and sort of vulnerable with you said, you know, who are you to do that? And, and I pushed that dream off for a long time and finally sort of drew a line in the sand and I said, I'm going to go for it and either it works or it doesn't, but I'm going to, I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to make this dream come true. I got involved in a mock trial program at Eastern Washington University that brought me to St. Paul. We, we made it to the national tournament, won some awards and as fate would have it, we we're supposed to leave it was March of 1995, I believe. We're supposed to leave and go back to the to Washington, but it snowed. Imagine that it snowed in, in Minnesota, and we couldn't leave. So I said, I'm going to go back over to this law school, which happened to be Hamlin University School of Law, and I'm going to talk to the dean. I did. We had a conversation, and at the end, he said, you're exactly the kind of person that we would love to have at our law school. Now, keep in mind... Yeah, no, no one had ever said that to me before. So 
I, I've been, a, a, in essence, the same place that the Clio students were, that, you know, that they find themselves in. So I've traveled the same journey. That's, that's a, a great story. And I have to ask, what, when you were in law school and you were there, t- what was the importance of mentorship and guiding um, what kind of field you were going to pursue? It was everything. It was, it was literally everything because when I came to law school, I, I landed in a law school in a location where I didn't know anybody, like nobody. And I became pretty good friends with the dean. Then I met a judge at the Minnesota Court of Appeals. And for a while, those two were my mentors. And I humbled myself. I said, anything they tell me to do, I'm willing to do it, even if I'm not sure it's right, because I didn't have any context to know whether it was right or wrong. And I figured both of these were very accomplished people. And if they told me to do it, I just did it. And, um, you know, over time, that led to all sorts of opportunities. I came out of law school, started working at a big law firm, was there for a little while, clerked for a federal judge. And, you know, just mentor after mentor showed up to help me. So the power of mentoring is critically important. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why we're so excited about um presenting you with the education award at our edge honors reception. It's, it's what we're hearing from our Clio students that participate in the Mitchell Hamlin campus for their pre-law summer Institute. You know, we hear over and over again, professor Petrie, professor Petrie, professor Petrie, and, and, and the word mentorship keeps coming up. Um, what, what do you think some of the, the barriers are for our students in, in seeking mentorship? I think it's a few things. Um, and some of it I think is getting a little bit better, but one is having people that are willing to be of service. That's, that's my whole thing. This isn't about me. This is about me being of service to others. And sometimes I think people get that paradigm mixed up. They, they get off into practice or they, you know, they become a judge or in-house counselor, whatever they're doing. And they get busy. I understand, but you have to be of service. You have to you have to be willing to support those who are coming after you. Um, and sometimes people are just too busy or they, you know, they think that they're better than other folks and then they're not willing to be of service. And what I have learned is, for me personally, nothing brings me more joy than being of service to someone else and then watching them grow, watching them get opportunities, watching them go out and, and succeed and do all sorts of things. So... You know, if we can get more people to make that shift and realize there's really a lot of joy, it seems sort of counterintuitive, right? Because it seems like I should be doing things for me, but I'm doing something for someone else. And now here's Petrie telling me that it's going to bring me joy. But I invite you to try it. I think you'll find out the same way I found out that that it really is uh, it's really a, a, an honorable thing to do. And it'll bring you a lot of joy. So, so great to hear. And I know that a lot of students are going to are going to hear that and they're going to say, hey, you know, it may be worth my while to ask, right? You mentioned something uh, in your introduction, Professor, that I found very interesting. When you said, here I am, uh, a black kid from Spokane, Washington. Um, who am I, you said. Uh, you know, how, how far did that idea of who am I follow you? I, I hear from my students, this imposter syndrome, they can't escape. Do you see it often with your students? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oftentimes, you know, they land in these classrooms and sometimes they're the only person uh, from their background in the classroom. And then, you know, they start talking about these topics. A lot of us haven't been exposed to these legal terms and terminology and Iraq and all that. And you're sitting in the classroom and you're thinking, Hey, maybe I'm in over my head. You know, maybe I don't belong here. And then I'm mean, just be honest. You know, there are some others that would be in the classroom that would, be bold enough to try to tell you that you don't belong there. Maybe even a professor or two somewhere along the way might, might say something like that. But my message to the students is this. Look, if you got into law school, you belong here. And find some mentors, find some people, find some friends that will support you. Find somebody like me that's, that's willing to not only support you, but stand in the gap and if need be, fight for you to make sure that you get equal access to legal education and an opportunity to launch a career that's just absolutely mind blowing. Because if you're here, you belong here. If you're in the Clio program, you belong here. So don't don't let yourself get caught up in that stuff. It it can happen, yes, but don't don't buy into that. 
And you having a firsthand experience with it, I'm sure, is priceless, especially for the students that you work with. Yeah, because I can understand what they're going through. I can, I, be, I became, this is weird too, over the years I became very empathetic. I can literally feel, I've had many students in my office, and when they come in, sometimes they come in in tears, sometimes they're frustrated, scared, whatever it might be. Well, I get it. I've, I've, been, uh, I've been in the same, the same seat as you. I, I understand. And so I can relate to them. And, you know, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes they might need a little love. They might need a little caring. Other times they might need a little, come on, let's go. And then a little pat on the, on the back, so to say. A Gen X tough love, as I call it, right, Professor? There you go. There you go. <laughs> you know, if, but but it works, and they, they need some of that Gen X. We got to bring it. We got to bring some of that enthusiasm sometimes, right? Um, yeah. it, it's so interesting. You mentioned the, the students uh, a lot. I like to hear from you of your of your, who is the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law student. If you would describe that student to us. Um, what what drives them? Where do they go after law school? What are some of the activities that they belong to? And how would you characterize them? Yeah, we have an amazing student body. You know, we have students ranging in age from 20 to 60 from all over the country. And to hear their backstories about what they had to do just to get here is absolutely amazing. Some of them come here, they they can't speak English when they, they, they migrate from some other part of the world. They can't speak English very well. They can't read English very well. And now they're in law school and they're trying to figure it out. But they do. They do. They might need a little extra support, but they figure it out. And then they go on to do all these amazing things. And these are people, a lot of them, who just wouldn't have an opportunity to go to law school if it wasn't for a place like Mitchell Hamlin. And that's not just right now. That's been the tradition of this school for over 100 years is providing those kinds of opportunities. So we might have, uh, to me, a, you know, a young, young, young adult, I'll say, uh, straight out of college, and we may also have a medical doctor in the same classroom. And so to have that sort of a network that you can draw upon and those kinds of resources, wisdom, knowledge, all of that that you can draw upon is just absolutely amazing. And that those are the kinds of students that we have at our law school. I love to hear the diversity in the background of the student that goes to Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. It's, it's, it's interesting to, to see that you can have doctors and, and young uh, students right out of college in the classroom learning torts, learning property, and, and discussing and forming um, uh, study groups. Uh, and yeah. Everyone benefits from that kind of diversity, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we have people from the inner city. We have people from rural areas. All these people coming together with one dream, and that is to become a lawyer. And they sit in these classrooms and they have these dialogues. Now, not everybody has the same beliefs, same thoughts, same values, but we're working really hard on creating classroom environments where all of those ideas can be expressed in productive ways Rather than, you know, I've, I believe this way, you believe that way, I'm right, you're wrong, you know, all these things. And then the classroom environment blows up and nobody's learning anything. I love to study neuroscience and share that with members of our faculty so that they can understand how people learn, so they can understand how people process information, and so that they can understand how to have these types of conversations in a productive way. I'll give you a great example. A couple of years ago after George Floyd, when Derek Chauvin was on trial, another professor here who's a former assistant U.S. attorney and I got together to teach a class on the trial. We had about 24 students in the class. About a third of them were either currently active in law enforcement or had been. About another third of them at that time was red hot about getting rid of the police. So we had the perfect storm for the classroom to blow up, but it didn't. We managed those conversations, and all the students walked away saying, wow, this was really neat. I didn't think this would happen. I learned so much. I learned different perspectives. And so it's possible. You just have to make the commitment and maybe develop some skills on how to you know, manage a classroom situation like that so that it's productive instead of explosive. And that's what we're doing here at Mitchell Hale. If only Congress were like you, right? Maybe then... <laughs> If only the Supreme Court of the United States would just have those conversations 
uh, the way you and your colleague did during that tough time in our country. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an interesting time, you know, politically, even legally, there's huge shifts happening in the law. And that's what makes it so important that we stay committed so that these students who are going to be practicing in this environment, because I don't think it's going to change you know, drastically in the next few years, but that we prepare these students to go out into that kind of an environment and have an impact, to get access to courtrooms, to boardrooms, to meetings, to politicians, to other people who are of influence so that they can be influential. Because if we don't do that, I was just thinking about it on the way in this morning. If we don't do that, we're going to be moving all the way back to the times of Brown versus Board of Education. We don't want that to happen. Well, I hear you. And I want to I want to talk more about the some of the political divisions and what our graduates are going to be dealing with right after our our segment, uh, Professor, that we call the lightning round. Uh, so if you could bear, bear with us as um, as as we play our intro to one of my favorite parts of our segment. All right. So so welcome to the lightning round, Professor, where we're just going to ask you a few questions. So that students know that you're a real person, right? So, um, what's your favorite, iPhone or Droid? I'm iPhone guy all day, every day. Oh man, I say everyone is iPhone. I'm, I'm Mr. Flip. You got to try this out, Professor. You got to try it out. Um, what what about your favorite social media? Is it Instagram or Facebook or maybe LinkedIn? You know, I'm kind of moving toward LinkedIn. I've been a, a Facebook guy for a long time, but I'm starting to lean into LinkedIn now. Yeah, you know, I see a lot of us moving towards LinkedIn. We've moved away from Twitter X and we find ourselves now more and more on LinkedIn. I don't know if, it, if it's our aging professor, but I'm with you on that one. Okay. What's, your, what's your favorite restaurant in Minnesota? Oh, the Handsome Hog. Uh, the Handsome Hog is my favorite restaurant. It's right down the street from the school. The food is excellent. And it's owned by a brother, so that's one of my favorite places. <laughs> okay, and I gotta ask, what is your favorite legal movie? Oh, Holy! Now, when I say legal movie, for those of you watching, I mean movies based on the legal practice. <laughs> yeah, I. You know, I don't watch a lot of legal movies. I. One of my favorite shows is an old school show, but they still play it. It was Perry Mason. Oh, That's yeah. what actually inspired me to want to be a lawyer. I thought Perry Mason was, you know, was so cool in the courtroom. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? My favorite was Matlock. Okay. As, as, as a TV show, but the award goes to A Few Good Men. I mean, what better movie than that? that, that was, I, I, I thought I was going to be a JAG officer after watching that movie. Oh, yeah. That was a good one. That was a good courtroom movie. That was a really good one. Now, um, what, is a, what is a good book that you recommend uh, students check out? They're probably going to be surprised, but it's a really good book, I think, is called The Art of Impossible. It's written by a guy named Stephen Kotler, and it looks at how you can get into flow. Now, you might say, well, why would that matter for a law student? Here's why it matters. Because if you can get into flow then you can accelerate learning, you can decrease stress, you can decrease a whole bunch of anxiety and all those negative things that a lot of students experience during um, during law school. And you can actually structure your study time so that you can be much more productive. So you're not spending, you know, having these all-nighters and all that kind of stuff. So the art- What's the name of that book? The art- Sorry, what's impossible. the name of that book again? Yep, it's The Art of Impossible, and the author is Stephen Cott. All right. Thank you for that. And lastly, what is your favorite vacation spot, Professor? Oh, Cabo. Cabo down in Mexico. Easy answer. There you go. All right. Thank you for playing uh, the, the lightning round with us, Professor. Thank you. We'll go back to our segment now. <laughs> professor, you were mentioning the divisions that exist currently um, in our country and how that may spill over into the legal practice. Now, I know that you see the political divisions firsthand. You, you live in a state that many of us consider a purple state these days. Um, how has that political division impacted the students at Mitchell Hamlin, if at all? 
Well, because of our diverse student body, there's definitely an impact. You know, we have students literally from all over the country, and they come to law school with varying political beliefs and ideologies, and that shows up in the classroom. And it, I, I think you hear this a lot in higher education, and that is that the conservative students feel like their voice can't be heard. Um, students from marginalized communities have been saying that for years, that their voice isn't heard. And so we're starting to see that tension uh, evolve in the classroom. The other thing that I would say is that these students now, they want to talk about these tough issues. They want to get into it. They, you know, when these decisions come from the Supreme Court or politically when things are happening, they want to talk about that. They want to have those kinds of conversations. Um, and so, you know, folks need to learn how to have those kinds of conversations. But that's where we're seeing it show up here. You know, it's interesting, the political divide in our country uh, spilling over. And I can see how students, because I teach at the Borough Manhattan Community College. Um, and I teach, I've been teaching there for a long time. And I sometimes see how that political division makes its way into the classroom and can impact the student body. I'm so happy to hear that you and your team have developed ways in which you could keep those divisions away from being hostile and good students could actually work together. And I, I was joking a little bit earlier, if only Congress could follow suit, but I think, uh, I think there's something to be said about when people could put their differences aside and talk about an issue. And one of the issues I see a lot of division in is the one that you and I were talking about earlier, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It seems to me, Professor, that there's, um, there seems to be a big push against uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion because now, I, I keep hearing the messaging be a problem. I hear folks believing that the work that we do in access and inclusion to be something about giving folks handouts. What do you have to say about that, Professor? The idea that any diversity, equity, and inclusion program is about giving handouts. I've always seen it as a hand up. I've seen it as access to information. I see it as giving people an opportunity to go toe to toe. But I keep hearing the the folks that you mentioned a little earlier that are attacking programs like uh, like the ones that we care about continue talking about handouts. What's your view on that, Professor? Yeah, that's that's just a political narrative trying to attract their base or keep their base engaged. Frankly, that is not true. This, this is not about handouts. It's a, you're right. It's about hands up for people who systematically have been denied access to education, employment opportunities, uh, purchasing real estate, the list goes on and on and on. One of the things that I've discovered here at, at our law school is that oftentimes if you talk about things like systemic racism, people will fight you on that. There's no such thing as systemic racism. What are you talking about? We had a black president. There's, if there was systemic racism, how could that happen? But if you actually educate them, like there's a great book called The Color of Law, and it talks about how systemic racism was baked into property rights, talking about restrictive covenants that would say, for example, if I owned a piece of property and there was a restricted covenant in it, it would say that I couldn't sell that piece of property to a person of color. So there are a lot of examples of those types of things that are baked into our legal system, that not only kept certain people from having those advantages, but it also provided opportunities for other people to generate, for example, generational wealth because they didn't have those barriers in place. Um, one of my good friends here is a professor. He teaches tax law, and he was explaining to me that the way the tax law system is set up is it benefits the wealthy and allows them to continue to generate wealth. But most of, of the people that look like us, at least those that I grew up around, we didn't know anything about tax law. All we knew is you had to file your taxes on April 15th. So no, this is not about handouts. This is about creating opportunities for people who were systemically not allowed to participate in a lot of different areas. And so we're going to continue staying committed to doing this work. And we thank you for that, Professor. You know, I, I run into a lot of folks. Um, I come from the political world here in New York, and I run into a lot of folks who uh, are split on this issue, and what I mentioned earlier, I think is, is the me the messaging is a major is a major issue. I think you hit it on the nose. But one thing we have to remind people 
is that we're not asking for extra points on the bar exam. We're not asking for extra points on the LSAT. Well, you continue to see with, with our program here at Clio and all the great work that we do with PLSI and Mitchell Hamlin School of Law is to prepare students to go toe-to-toe. I mean, think about that. We want to we wanna help you go into battle and go toe-to-toe against folks that did not have the barriers that you did. And I, I, for the life of me, I have no understanding of how someone could oppose preparation. That's all we're asking for. Let's prepare our students and give them the mentorship and the know-how and the ability to go toe-to-toe. It really is something out of this world. Yeah, it really is. And I, I understand why, they, why they're why they taking those positions. Again, it's just, it's a narrative, but it's a false narrative. And it also creates a false dichotomy. The false narrative is created because the reality of it is, is a lot of people are afraid, Right globalization is happening. That's going to continue. The global economy is a real thing. And so in the global economy and with all this globalization going on, people are being forced into positions where they have to figure out how do I deal with people who have a different set of values, different set of beliefs, look different than me, all these other things. And some of those folks say, hey, everything was great before and I don't want it to change. But the world has already changed and it's going to continue to change. And this is the new world that we're living in. And so we have to get people prepared so that we can, like you said, we're not looking for, you know, give me, spot me 30 points on the bar exam, even though I haven't done anything or start me off with that. Give, just give me an A in a class, even though I haven't really done any work. No, this is about getting people prepared to perform at high levels in this new world that we're living in. And the reality of it is that's really non-negotiable. That must happen. Now, I think we're going through an evolutionary process where people are trying to figure this thing out. Some are trying to you know, create a world that no longer exists, go back to that. And others like you and I are getting people prepared for this new world. And so again, that's why I'm, I'm committed. That's why I'm passionate about doing this work. I, I love to hear, I find you so invigorating, Professor, your, your positions on this, you know, because we're part of a, of a bigger team. There's a lot of us around the country that care deeply about this issue. And when we get together and speak about these issues, it's always exciting. And a lot of students uh, are watching, a lot of future lawyers are watching, a lot of attorneys that have gone through our program are watching our interaction today. And they, they want to hear, I'm sure they want to hear, like, wh- what does the future look like? You know, what does the future look like considering the Supreme Court decision, considering the environment right now? considering what administrators like you are dealing with in, in, in law school administration, what does the future look like? How can we help? Um, and, and what advice do you have for us, Professor? Yeah, I think it's, it, there's a couple of things. There's a short-term play and the long-term play. In the short term, we have to roll up our sleeves and stay busy. We have to stay committed. We are in a sort of in a war right now, right? We're in, we're in this transition period where some folks are trying to pull us backward while at the same time we're trying to continue to maintain the advancements that we've had so far and continue to make advancements into the future. So that's the short-term play. So, you know, roll up your sleeves, get ready, bring your lunch bucket because we've got work to do. In the long-range future, I see a ton of possibilities And I'm really glad you asked because sometimes this is the stuff that doesn't get talked about. I look at advancements in technology. I look at advancements in the medical field. I look at the global market and even a number of the law firms that I talked to. I had lunch uh, last Friday with a buddy of mine. He's at a big law firm. They have clients who want people inside those law firms that understand how to get in, you know, how to succeed in cross-cultural situations. They need that in order for the work that needs to be done to get done. So those opportunities are out there and they're going to continue to be out there. That's not going away. And that's why I want to get our students prepared so that they can capitalize on those opportunities. So I I actually, I see the future is bright, but in order to realize that there's some short-term work that we'll need to do. It might be a little bit, a little bit of a struggle. I call it process pain. But there's process pain that takes you to a better place in the future, or you could just sit here and, and complain about it, which I did for a couple of days after that decision, and then nothing happened. So stay committed, 
Roll up your sleeves. Let's get to work. We're going to create this future that's make it better for our people. We're so excited to hear that. Uh, Professor Kidd, if, if there's a potential law student out there that wants to take a look at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, what, what's the website that they can visit? Yeah, it's www.mitchellhamlin.edu. And we would welcome you with, with open arms. Our, our faculty has become more diverse. We are revamping our DEI department. It's not going anywhere. We're calling it DEI 2.0 now. And it will be designed that there be no discrimination across the board for anybody. Nobody's going to be discriminated against in the admissions process, in the classroom, in access to employment opportunities. So we would welcome you to come to our community uh, and get involved. There's a lot of good things here. And you'll get some of me, too, as a coach. So it's all good. And how's how's the how's the area around the law school? How is it? Can you describe it to us? I'm from the Bronx. I haven't been out there. So tell us. Oh, yeah. It's it's really an interesting neighborhood. Uh, we are on a street called Summit Avenue. And if you go up and down the street, there's all these beautiful mansions. You go down the street far enough, there's a big, big mansion that was owned by, this is a funny story. It's owned by the, it's owned by the state of Minnesota now, but it's the James J. Hilliard Mansion, or Hill, James J. Hill Mansion. Now, I told you I grew up in Spokane. I didn't tell you the neighborhood that I grew up in was called Hilliard. I did not know that that neighborhood was named after this guy, James J. Hill. So there's just, you know, all this beautiful um, architecture in the area. We're not too far from the state capitol and the Minnesota Judicial Center, which is where the Minnesota Court of Appeals and the Minnesota Supreme Court sit. And then right in downtown St. Paul, there's also the Ramsey County District Court and the U.S. District Court for the District of Minnesota has two offices, one in Minneapolis and one in St. Paul. So that's pretty close, too. So hopefully that gives you a little a little taste of what the vibe was like around. Here. Wow. And a wonderful opportunities for internships. Oh, yeah. Not only do we have internships, we have something that I think is is pretty rare in law school, and that is a legal residency. And a legal residency is a full semester, full immersion experience where our students get an opportunity to go work in a, in a law firm or work for a court or in some other organization and do the work that lawyers do for a full semester. They can earn up to 14 academic credits for that. They can get paid. And so it's a really cool opportunity. So we're all about experiential learning and getting people literally ready to get out into the world after they graduate and start practicing law. I read about the legal residency uh, on your website, and I found it to be so interesting, similar to what medical schools do. And I think, I think it's going to catch on. I wish I would have had that semester before. Oh, yeah. I wish I would have had it, too. I, I did a couple of clerkships, but never anything like that where I could you know, spend a full semester completely immersed in the practice of law. So, yeah, it is really neat. Yeah. Well... Professor Petrie, thank you so much for joining us here at the Clio Edge podcast. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for providing all this insight for us. And we are so looking forward to celebrating with you on April 11th in Washington, D.C., as you receive the Education Award at the Clio Edge Honors Reception Dinner. I'm so honored and humbled. I can't wait till April 11th to join you for the celebration. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. Have a great day. You as well. We want to thank Professor Rick Petrie again from Mitchell Hamlin School of Law for joining us on a very exciting episode. We want to make sure that all of you are aware of our incredible events happening in April 11th in Washington, D.C. We have our Clio Career Expo happening at the American University Washington College of Law starting at 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Please visit our website at cleowink.org so you can see some more information for those of you that want to attend or if you want to sponsor a table and participate in our career expo you'll be able to speak to many law students across the dmv area many in the northeast as well that will be there and for those of you that are law students please come down you'll be able to get resume advice interview workshops and be able to speak to recruiters firsthand as to what they're looking for and maybe even get an internship so that you're ready to go uh, while you complete your, your, your law school education. We're really looking forward to seeing you there. And for those students that do participate uh, at the Clio Career Expo, we want to make sure that you also come down to the Clio Edge Honors Reception uh, later that evening. 
And we want to make sure that all of you are aware of our April 11th event uh, in Washington, D.C. We have an incredible uh, group of folks that are getting awarded uh, for the Bernie Jordan Award this year. Cleo is honoring Neil Katia, who's a partner at Hogan's and Lavelle's and was the acting solicitor general for the United States and currently teaches at George Washington School of Law. We also have, as you heard him uh, at this recent episode, Professor Rick Petrie of the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law is receiving the Education Award. We have Judge Phyllis Thompson receiving the Diversity Award. And finally, Brian Parker, who is a co-founder and CEO of Legal Innovators, a true trailblazer, receiving the award for greater equality. We're asking all of you to please consider uh, supporting Clio uh, as we go on to our April 11th Edge Reception and Career Expo. Visit our website, cleowink.org, register for the expo, register to participate, and most importantly, please come down and support us at our Edge Reception. We are looking forward to seeing you there on April 11th at the Greenberg Trials of Offices in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Until the next episode, have a great day.